Hi, I'm Manish Thavan with my good friend Puneet Khurana. We run a blog by the name of stoicinvesting.com. This is our podcast series. Life is too short to learn from just your own experiences. To inculcate vicarious learning, we will be interviewing and profiling interesting people from different walks of life. Hopefully, this endeavor will shorten the learning curve for our audience. It's amazing how the dots connect. I happen to be a huge fan of Charlie Munger and have studied his life work extensively. During one of his lectures, he mentioned an important life lesson. He said that you learn the most through outliers, the extreme successes and the spectacular failures. The mundane life follows a normal bell curve distribution and there is not much learning there, if any. You would do well if you pick up the traits from the extreme examples. And then I came across Eugene Palmer's efficient market hypothesis. And Eugene himself confessed that value and momentum are two anomalies and outliers. From there on, I went on a search of empirical evidence supporting these anomalies. And the topmost result on the search showed Mr. Wesley Gray, who has done one of the most extensive back tests on this subject spanning 40 years data. I today proudly present to you our interview with Mr. Wesley Gray, where we talked in detail about this amazing empirical evidence. Listen in. Hey, Manish. Hey, Wesley. How are you today? Uh, pretty good. I wish my uh, computer had worked a little better, but uh, it sounds like things are working here on my laptop. Great, great. Finally get to uh, hear your voice. Uh, we're joined in the call uh, by Puneet Khurana. Hey, Wesley. How are you? Hey, hey, Puneet. How you doing? Oh, very um, good, very good. Uh, good to have you with us uh, today. Hi, right, Wesley. So let, let's start from the uh, you know because you talked about your current book that you're writing about momentum. Uh, and in fact, in one of your blogs, you, you define the quality of momentum. Now, that's a pretty rare thing, you know. You, you say yeah. to avoid flash in the pan, sudden spurts and crisis kind of situations, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just curious to know how do you do that? I mean, is there an algo that takes care of that or is it a visual segregation that you do? Um, no, yeah, it's, everything we do is uh, algorithmic just because a lot more efficient for the uh, computer to do it than for me to do it. Um, yeah, and, and the basic thing when, it, when you look at momentum – you know, kind of like in uh, like value investing, where you know you want to focus on cheap. Uh, in momentum, obviously, you want to focus on strong, but it's important that you focus on, you know, kind of the path of how a stock gets strong, because you don't want stocks that you know jump all around the place. Right. Um, yes, yeah, so we we just use an algorithm. It essentially it, it's called the frog in the pan algorithm. If you can, uh, <laughs> you can believe that, but. <laughs> Um, yeah. and the basic idea is, is you want with, you know, momentum, you, you want that momentum where, you know, the water kind of slowly gets to boiling. You, you don't want the, uh, the you water, to just, the <laughs> yeah, you don't want to just start boiling immediately because then the right. frog will jump out. Um, cause momentum is, is, a well, at least behaviorally, the argument is that it's driven by an underreaction to uh, positive news. And so, the, the more you can find securities where it's more likely that there's more underreaction versus overreaction, the better. Um, so our, our algorithm essentially looks at the path where if you have two, let's say you have two stocks that are both up, whatever, 50%, right? So that they have the same absolute return after, you know, let's say a year. Um, then what you look at is you look at every single day within that time series and you just if you're positive, you get one point, um, and if you're negative, you get, you know, negative one point. And you ba or you basically add up all the daily positives and all the uh, the daily negatives, and you just you want to own securities where the ratio of, um, you know, the percentage of daily positives is higher relative to other securities because if they have the same ending return, but one has a higher proportion of daily positive returns. It means that the you know the average daily positive return is, is probably going to be, you know, not as not as big as the one that has the same return but but fewer 
positive return. So we want to kind of get like a smooth momentum path. We don't want one that bounces all over the place. Got it. It's interesting that you say that, Wesley, because, you know, I was going through the FAQ of Ed Sakota. I don't know if you know him. He's a, a trained yeah, follower. Yeah, Right. And he also mentioned in one of the answers that he's idly looking for a 45-degree move, uh, a, a price movement which literally cuts the uh, cuts the desktop screen diagonally. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and, you, and there's I mean there's a lot of ways you can measure this. Um, we just use that algorithm because it's it's in a it's in a published academic paper and we just coded it up and. You know, we use it, but there, there's a hundred ways you could try to quantify that. I think people use like min max averages across the, or like min and maxes, daily min max across the whole series, and divide it by, you know, standard deviation. There, there's however you want to do it. It doesn't really matter as long as you're capturing that nature where you know, as Ed Sakota is saying there, where you want that 45 degree movement towards momentum. You don't want the one that looks like a, you know, a staircase that sometimes goes way down, sometimes goes way up. Right. Like ideally, you get smooth momentum to uh, to high momentum. You don't get you know crazy momentum. Um, uh, but just to get the context, you are currently um, a professor, also, right? At uh, which yeah, college I, you are? Um, yeah, so so I I was a professor at Drexel. So I still am a, an affiliated there. I'm a clinical. I'm, I resigned my uh, full time job though, uh, or full time professor there, just so I could you know run our business. But yeah, I'm still a uh, I'm still affiliated with uh, Drexel University. It's an engineering okay. college. Okay, and uh, oh, that's an engineering college. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, so I, I'm, I'm with the business school, but it, it's it, it's. Predominantly a uh, like oh, an engineering. Okay. I, I, I understood. It's yeah, very much similar to very similar to what I do. I am affiliated with this college called uh, IIT Delhi. Uh, yeah. So IITs are the prominent technology institutes in our yeah. country, and yeah. uh, but they have the management side where I am a visiting faculty. So I think it's a very similar kind of affiliation. Yeah, yeah, exa- exactly. Exactly. You, you got the same exact idea. Okay. So, okay. so Wesley, tell me. Uh, let's start from the start. In that case, how did you get into stock markets? Now, if I understand correctly, uh, you you're an ex marine as well, correct? Yeah, that's right. I used, was in the Marines uh, for four years as well. That's right. Okay. So, how did this transformation happen, and how did you get into stock market, and how's been the journey so far? Um, sure. So, I, I actually kind of got into investing way back in the day when I was a kid. Um, I I grew up on a on a ranch in uh, Colorado. Where you know we used to have you know cattle and horses, all that kind of stuff. Okay. And um, in in America, they have a thing called 4-H, where you where kids basically raise animals, and then you bring them down to the local fair, and then you sell them, and then people you know pay more than the market price is because it's more of a kind of a you know philanthropic thing. So you know they want to encourage kids to learn how to, you know, raise animals and work hard or whatever. So sure. I did that as growing up as a kid, kind of start getting, you know, a couple grand here or there, which when you're, you know, 10, 12 years old is, is a lot of money. And I just, you know, I just thought that was pretty cool. I was making money. And so I asked my dad, I was like, hey, how do you, you know, I should probably do something with this. And he's like, yeah, you should. You need to invest it, not buy, you know, Nintendo games or whatever. Um and so I ended up talking to my grandmother, who was a huge fan of Warren Buffett and Benjamin Graham. So she kind of got me hooked really early, like literally when I was, you know, a kid on on value investing, if you can believe it. So so I've kind of had the investment bug, you know, for a long time. And then, um, you know, so time goes on. Uh, you know, I went to Wharton undergrad at the University of Pennsylvania. Just, you know, it's a business school focused on finance. Um, did a lot of research there for the professors. They said, hey, you should go to your Ph.D. Um, so I was like, all right, I'll, that sounds great. Being a finance professor would be a, a great job because you just get paid to sit around and think about finance and investing all day. Um, <laughs> so I was like, this, is, this seems like a great idea. Um, so then, then I, uh, I got into a Ph.D. program. Uh, at at uh, University of Chicago, Chicago another, another kind of big, big finance, finance place. place, and yeah, yeah just just start doing research and 
you know, full time, 15, 20 hours a day studying. Um, and I, you know, so I was in that program. I was there for a few years. And then in PC programs, you finish like your first two years. And then you get to what they call ABD, which is all but dissertation. And, and at that point, I, I, I was honestly kind of burnt out a little bit. Um, and I, I was just wanted to do uh, my service just because I was like the United States and, you know, what it stood for and everything. So uh, I ended up joining the service, and uh, I was in the Marines for four years, kind of basically taking a break at some level from finance. Um, did all that and then came back and finished up my dissertation, kind of got back into finance and was super excited after having a nice long break there and then uh, got a, a job as a professor here at Drexel in Philadelphia, which is where my uh, wife's from. And you know, right right around that same time, I got a call from a guy who who's a really rich guy out of New York and he just asked, hey, can you consult uh, you know, I've been reading your, your research and, and reading your blog for a long time now. And I was like, sure. Um, you know, so one, a small consulting job got to a bigger consulting job, which eventually turned into an asset management job where they seeded up our, uh, you know, quantitative value fund, uh, basically a fund based off that book that, that Toby and I wrote. Um, and then the rest is history. You know, now we've, you know, now we're full time in the business. I got you know half our team as my former students at Drexel, and uh, we have ETFs and the whole nine yards, and yeah, just kind of living the dream every day. You know. Oh, wow, so, you know that's that's very fascinating, Wesley. Um, a couple of questions on that only. First of all, was your grandmother an investor? <laughs> yeah, she was. Oh, um, right. She was huge, hardcore value investor. Like read every single book known to man but about or by you know Warren Buffett or, or Benjamin Graham wow. so she, she was hardcore uh, wow. so, into value investing so you got your first security analysis lesson in uh, or at what age <laughs> uh, uh, I think I was probably around like 12 or something wow. um, yeah she gave me uh, yeah I got intelligent investor she gave me I literally I'd get a book from her every year I got like Buffettology Warren Buffett way, like all that stuff. I was just every year I'd get a book, um, you know, from from a grandma genie. I kind of was hoping I'd get a Super Nintendo game, but just <laughs> never worked out. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, um, so you have written this book, Quantitative Value with Tobias. What was your when 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 does your association with Tobias started? Uh, were you working with him? Was Greenback both of you combined together? No, no, no. So we've never been affiliated. Basically, so so I had done all the research. I've been thinking about building, you know, the quantitative value system for probably, I don't know, 10, 12 years because my dissertation was about value investing. You know, I, I programmed and coded like everything you ever imagined. I actually ran like a small uh, hedge fund before that. And then we'd actually met at a value investing congress. It's you know, something in New York where a right. bunch of yeah. famous value investors yeah. pitch a stock. Yeah. And I, one of our, our big uh, clients was out there, um, who, who's, his son is actually a partner in our business, and we just took, Toby was there, and I was like, hey, man, we should uh, go out to dinner. So we were sitting around there at dinner and just kind of talking, and, he, right. and, we're like, and I was like, yeah, you know, I'd like to write this book about, you know, systematic value investing and working on it a long time. And Toby's like, yeah, yeah, that, that sounds like great. I'd love to like collaborate on something like that. And then you know, it turns out we, we kind of had the same motivations, and and you know, he had a lot more time to actually focus on you know the, the writing component, the storyboarding, and and I could kind of focus on the, the analysis and, and the structure of the book. Um, so it was kind of a, a good match where you know he he's like a, a really good writer can kind of storyboard and, and, you know, communicate, you know, right. complex ideas in a digestible way. And then I could do right. all the, you know, analysis and, and framework, <laughs> you know, right. build out the system. And, and uh, you mentioned that your client approached you after looking at a blog. Uh, was there a separate blog than Greenback or are you talking about the same blog? Yeah, yeah. We've always had, uh, so, so we run alphaarchitect.com now. Architect, yeah. But before that, it was uh, turnkeyanalyst.com. Oh, and right. then before that, because I've been writing a blog 
I think probably longer than, than Toby has, like almost probably eight or nine years now. Um, it was it was called the Empirical Finance Research uh, Blog. It was I don't even remember what the the title was, but what I'd do is I would read academic papers and then summarize them. Actually, when I was a PhD student, and then post my summaries on a blog, um, mm-hmm. and just you know ran. And then we still kind of do that now. We just formalized it, but I've, I've been doing that for so, a long time. So is that is the blog still relevant, or is all that content is it there for us to uh, refer for the readers to uh, go yeah, through? Yeah, yeah. AlphaArchitect.com has not not stuff. our old old blogs. So we have blogs that. Like, I think there's probably a thousand blog posts on Alpha Architect now, um, right. and I think it goes back maybe five, six years, but some of the old, old content, I, I can't remember, it just got lost, like, like, trying to transition, to transition it. it, so I'm, I'm sure, sure it's somewhere, somewhere out there on the internet, internet, but I don't even know where it is personally, personally. But, but yeah, AlphaArchitect.com is where the vast majority of our content is, and we post usually one, two times a day, so. Well, well that, that will be good enough anyways. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, um, so you know, uh, Tobias has been writing on Green Bank about various value investing strategies. Uh, I've been reading his blog for, for you know, seven, eight years now, and um, you had that inclination, as your name, as the name of your blog suggests, you know, that empirical uh, financial analysis. If I'm not wrong, right? Yeah. So. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so it seems like. You had a quant bend of mind from the very starting. Um, did you ever challenge that view? First question, uh, because most of the time people give, uh, I think, in my opinion, too much importance sometimes. But still, a lot and lot of importance on the qualitative part of it, um, and uh, most of them are actually famous for saying that you know um, quantitative is essentially ten percent of the work, if at all. Uh, so. Yeah. How do you take that point of view and, you know, um, how, what do you sure. think about that? Yeah, so I actually used to be one of those people. Um, so, so I've been trading, you know, um, special situation, liquidations. I was doing that through the Internet bubble. Like the, the minute I was old enough to, you know, start trading my own account, I was. So, and I used to be a hardcore Ben Graham, Warren Buffett, Quant is all a bunch of crap uh, type person um, right. and I did that for you know a long time and uh, you know made a lot of money lost right. a lot of money and then it's actually in 2008 I actually launched a hedge fund and that was supposed to be fully quantitative in September 2008 right so oh, I done wow. I done stock picking I, I thought quantitative people were insane. Um, you know, as far as investing, I learned all the techniques, obviously, in PhD program, but I've always kind of like, yeah, you know, whatever, uh, I'm just going to go be a stock picker, and I did that for a long time, and then I finally kind of came to the realization, I was like, you know what, maybe this quantitative stuff is a better approach, so I literally rallied up, uh, I think it was like two or three million dollars, and launched a hedge fund that was essentially a, like, kind of basically quantitative value, like that algorithm, except they had a short uh, book as well, and it launched in September 2008, and uh, you know it actually did pretty good because it was hedged um, going in there. But then, of course, what what did I do? Well, I started changing the model. So in November, December, <laughs> I went back to my old ways where I noticed all these you know cigar butts showing up, where there's all these you know a lot of biotechs that were selling for less than their working capital, and I, and I was like, hey, you know. Forget this quant stuff. Let's go back to picking stocks. I've been doing that my whole life, and let's just go buy companies for less than their working capital. You know, I actually did like an activist play for like I remember some biotech. You probably Google about it, Um, but I went back to doing that. Like right during the financial crisis, started doing like old school special situations, and then you know kind of made a lot of money, and then kind of lost a lot of money. And then after, I think, two or three years, basically it was Russell 2000, but with way more volatility. Um, And then what I did is I said, okay, I'm going to go look back and say, what would have happened if I just stuck to the original model and never, you know, deviated back to my old ways? And, of course, I would have outperformed the Russell 2000 by, like, 50 percentage points with a lot less volatility, but... 
and, and that was kind of my my kumbaya moment where I was like, you know what? Yeah, I just need to stop. I'm an I'm a addicted. Uh, you know, I'm a I'm a stop picking <laughs> addict. It doesn't work, you know. And I it, I just I just said, you know what? I'm quant 100 percent from here on out. It, it's just I have my own evidence now with myself, and I I can't I, I'm not Warren Buffett. I can't control you know my bias problems and right. I just ever since then I've. I've only I only do quantitative stuff now. Interesting, interesting. Uh, pretty interesting stuff, Wesley. So you essentially saying that quant basically saves you from the behavior biases and uh, uh, you know helps you in pulling the trigger when it's supposed to be pulled. That's right. Um, just systems help you do your buy. They help you do your sell, and they they force you to be disciplined on on some sort of philosophy or program and and i think that it just that'll eliminate a lot of problems that most people don't even recognize that are occurring most of the time oh Wesley, first of all um just to have some clarity the fund which you launched in 2008 yeah. uh, that was only long only fund right there was no short component there well it started off there was um okay. and you know obviously i probably should have done that uh, and stuck with it uh, but what I ended up doing is I ended up actually just punting on entirely on the quantitative stuff and going to just stock picking, which ended up just being long only, um, you know, picking up cigar butts and everything. Right. So, so yeah, it was uh, long short. It wasn't market neutral, but it was you know long and, and you could you could short it as well. So. so what was the what was the rationale for shorting? If I can ask the algorithm which you placed. Was it based on value or uh, yeah. was it based on uh, purely, I mean, technical, uh, you know? Uh, no, no, the, yeah, that, that fund was 100% value. It was literally like the quantitative value algorithm. Uh, okay. It was just, you know, you want to go, you want to be long, cheap, high-quality firms, and then, you know, if, if the prices aren't too high on the rebates and the shorts, you, right. you want to short basically expensive junk. Um, yeah, that That's the... Right. So, you know, so I, I, I mean, this, I think you mentioned in the book also, and uh, that there was my first question to you. A lot of uh, famous short sellers, um, the likes of Chanos and many other short sellers, they have always said that you, you should never, ever uh, short a company based on the valuations. Um, essentially, they do say, I mean, um, that the only parameter which is relevant is that it's a, it's a, so to say, a fraud company which has not been recognized or... Yeah. something where cooking of the books is happening and has not been recognized. This is where you short and then you become an activist sort of person rather than just looking yeah. for the markets to catch up. So yeah. how do you build that component into your uh, algorithmic, uh, you know, or way of working? Yeah. Is um, what I have so ba- basically, I agree. So I used to think uh, back in the day that shorting individual securities was a reasonable idea Um but but now I've kind of learned my lessons the hard way and just through experience. Now I think shorting individual securities is absolutely insane. It's tax inefficient, insanely costly, has huge operational risk. So we actually run market neutral and, and some fancier strategies, but we just short like a broad market future, uh, and we don't do individual securities for a lot of the reasons that Chinos and those guys mentioned because – you know, if you short based on valuation, yeah. you you can go bankrupt right. a lot more mm-hmm. often than you can be right. And yeah, right. you're going to be right in the end, but you went bankrupt, so you weren't right. Um, right. So yeah, frankly, we don't we don't do that. And and I've actually done. I, I we actually ran a model. Um, well, here's a good here's a perfect example. So we we another time. I launched some capital for a, for one of our actually still he's a client. We were doing a market neutral purely quant strategy, and it was a short only strategy. We were short based on fraud, um, manipulation, <laughs> forensic accounting things. And yeah. um, and when we did all the research, you know, it was crazy. You'd make it's like thirty percent alpha. Or it's not even believable, right? right. Um, and and so when we started going to the marketplace to start to implement this strategy, what we noticed is that the alpha, you know, in expectation was, let's say, 30, which right. is, again, crazy. But then when you look at the short rebate costs and all these other things, like the cost of carry was like 20 to 25. Right. 
and because everyone already knew that these things were total pieces of junk. And then once you, you know, so even though there, there seemed to be a spread between the expected alpha and the cost of carrying the positions, just the risk of shorting, the fact that, you know, it can, it's super volatile, it just didn't make sense. And we actually ran those strategies, I don't even remember when that was, like 2010 maybe or whatever, and I think it lost like 30% in three months. Wow. Um, and we just said, you know what? And I think it ended up making money like the next few months, but it just wasn't worth it because the cost was so high and the volatility was so insane. We just said, this is a great way to go bankrupt. Uh, <laughs> so, but right. we, we do a lot of stuff like that. Like right. even to this day, because we have a lot of rich guys we work with where we, we just run a lot of R&D on real money um, where, where we do a lot of like proprietary trading things where you know we, we get a lot of crazy ideas but you know you can only test ideas so much in in fake data. Eventually, you need to do it on real data. And so, so we just trade strategies. We'll take like 500k and put it in a, an account, and we don't charge them any fees. And, and the idea is like, hey, if this really works, you know, you get capacity on it. But you know, a lot of them don't work. So, but we need to test them on real money. So, in shorting expensive stocks was one of those experiments that went terribly wrong so and then you have <laughs> to provide <laughs> and then you have to also provide a good enough time frame for it to work uh, if i'm right and um, i'm not sure how easy it is for for you to convince somebody to give that much of money for that longer time period on which you want to test the strategy on mm-hmm. so well, um, and, and i think um, even if you have people's long time period the issue is like the prime brokers, you have margin calls and, and they, have, they have to ask capital. So even if you have Horizon, you know, 20 year Horizon, if you go bust along the way, right. it doesn't matter. So we have investors that have, I mean, they're literally like Warren Buffett. They got Forever Horizon and they're really sophisticated. But just mechanically, you can't, you can't get past the you know, the, the huge drawdowns and, and fees and costs and all that stuff. So, so that's really the main problem is not, not even Horizon, more about the operational problems. True. And, you know, as a standalone strategy, it anyways doesn't make sense. Probably what, uh, probably what Nassim Talib does, you know, uh, with his clients, that mm-hmm. the whole hedge fund is basically uh, a hedge against the long. So there are people who have... Who are already yeah. long and they are investing with Talib to as an insurance, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, and that's what this thing was was meant to be as well. Um, we've just over time found way better ways to uh, insure portfolios that don't involve shorting uh, individual securities. So okay. Okay. we just don't do that anymore. So just to be clear, now currently you uh, do shorting, but it's only on indices. That's right. Yeah, so, so if we if someone comes to us and they say, hey, we want more of an alternative exposure, because um, we do a lot of custom portfolios, we, we also run like an internal hedge fund. Right. We, yeah, for just shorting to kind of hedge the market risk, right. we just short like S&P futures or, or whatever exposure we want to get rid of through the futures market. We don't do so, it on... So what's the, what's, what's, the, what's the thinking behind the short? What's the, you know, the algorithm? What is it searching? What is it looking for? Yeah, so basically, um, the, and again, we do a lot of things, but you know, we're big trend followers, so l- l- let's say you're long value, right? L- let's say you're a long only value investor, which you know, I think if you have Horizon and your discipline is a great idea, uh, especially if you do it concentrated and you, you know, keep fees and taxes down. Right. Um, the problem with long only investing is that you know, you get your face ripped off because if the market blows up 50%, it doesn't matter if you pick the best value stocks in the world, you're going to also lose a lot, right? It doesn't, right. you know, right. so so if we could figure out how to manage the beta component of, you know, long-only investing, why right. wouldn't we do that? So we have some systems where, You know, we also do momentum, but, you know, let's just pretend that we're just value-only guys, which, you know, I'm obviously a huge value fan. So you you run value, but you don't want to just be long value and implicitly the market all the time. So, and what we do is if a long-term trend breaks, 
i.e., like you know, like a market just an asset class is no longer you know trending. We don't want to be exposed to that market risk, so we'll still stay long the value stocks, but then we'll short you know an S and P future basically get to a market neutral stance. We're now now we're just betting on the spread between those value stocks and the passive indice, but we're not betting on where the market's going, right? So so we're still long value, but we're not long the the market risk component because it's just you know we think it's a bad time to be exposed to that. So we have but, systems. That and, do that. and when you say value, I'm assuming that you're talking quantitative models here only. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we do quantitative value. There, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. there's no quantitative so, aspect involved, right? Nope. Everything we do is 100% automated, systematic. Yeah. Great. That's uh, interesting, Wesley. Uh, you know, I, I've noticed that generally, once a person dedicates himself to a given field, let's say value mm-hmm. investing then yeah. he would get so engrossed and in love with his own craft that mm-hmm. you know he would almost start despising the other fields and it's yeah. pretty rare to come across a person uh, you know who foregoes the commitment bias and mm-hmm. has the ability to study both valuation and momentum uh, i just wanted yeah. to understand your psychology on that how did you come about this well um it, it's kind of like uh I guess you have to be part of the religion to eventually realize the religion's crazy. So, and that's kind of what happened with me and values. So, I, I was part of the card carrying, Bible thumping, Ben Graham intelligent investor you know, class for many, many years, and I still am. But eventually, you realize that you know why do you have to only focus on one religion? Because there's other people that have different religions, and maybe they have good ideas too. And so, you know, because some people, like there's technical people that think that value people are absolutely insane and just crazy. And then there's value people that think the technical people are absolutely insane and crazy. But at some point, you got to be like, you know what, am I going to be an evidence-based person that that thinks logically and openly about all ideas or am I just going to be dogmatic um, about my religion? And, and I just had kind of a kumbaya moment where I was like, you know what? I got it. I love value. I'm part of that religion. But I'm going to at least explore other people's ideas and be open to new and different concepts. And then the minute I did that is the minute I realized that that's a great idea because it's not, you know, value investing doesn't have a monopoly on the only good ideas in, in the market. There's, and you got to be careful about it, but, but I think there are other just as good, if not better ideas, you know, from other investing religions out there. Right. Uh, you, so. know, uh, you know, it's, a, uh, it's fascinating you said that because um, one big reason why me and Manish work together uh, is, and in fact, it's very much, very much similar thought process behind our working together. When we first met, Manish is a, downright at Sikota fan, you know, uh, he's a yeah. follower, sure. uh, likes to uh, ride the winners and, mm-hmm. and and mostly on the basis of uh, price behavior rather than the intrinsic yeah. value behavior. I have mm-hmm. been on the absolute opposite end, um, yeah. a fully value investor, but had this idea that, you know, um, it, it cannot be only this. There are so many people without with very different ideas. So, um, you know, things can be combined. I'm not sure whether they can. We, me and Manish work together on many, many crazy ideas, just like you do. And sure. uh, sometimes we have good ones. Sometimes we have really bad ideas. Um, yeah. But well, you, you know, I always... love um, you. You love quantitative momentum. That, that's what that book is all about. <laughs> the yeah, thesis of that book is, is yeah, we're, we're going to try to convince value investors that momentum investing is actually no different. Investing is all about exploiting uh, expectation errors in the marketplace, you know, and front running other right. traders out there. And you know, they're the yeah. same thing. They're just di- different ways of going about it. it interesting, uh, you say that. So I'm eagerly waiting for. Right, uh, we're definitely eagerly awaiting for that book. Uh, that will be a great read. Uh, I just wanted to know. You know, I read uh, on one of your blogs where you did a back test. I think it was mm-hmm. a 40 year back test where you, uh, you know, there were four quadrants and on one mm-hmm. of the quadrants you had both value and momentum portfolio. Uh, mm-hmm. That apparently did not do well. 
uh, compared to individually following value or momentum is that still work in progress um yeah so so we have a like a really really deep uh post it's called combining value and momentum where we look at a whole bunch of techniques of you know what is how does one integrate the, you know value and momentum into a portfolio and here's some of the key takeaways i would say that if you do value, if you buy cheap stocks and you look for cheap stocks that have high momentum, that's a reasonable approach. We think the quantitative value algorithm already does that because it does cheap stocks that have quality, and it turns out that that quality component essentially is related to the high momentum component. So it's essentially six of one, half a dozen the other. So if you want to go cheap, and you want to add momentum in there, I'm not going to tell someone that's a bad idea, right? Yeah. Go for it. Now, what we find, though, and this is something that Cliff Asnes talks about and you know, we find in our own research, is that you really want to exploit the fact that people have religions. So because there's a huge benefit to combining pure value and pure momentum in, in their most religious forms, right? So for value... Just hold a portfolio of like the cheapest crap you can find that also has some indications of quality and then put that aside. Then go over and say, okay, momentum. Let's find a basket of portfolios with the highest potential relative strength or whatever your momentum signal is. Right. And now let's take those two kind of pure play features and then just do 50-50. Right. And the beauty about that is that one, you, you can analyze and assess exactly where your returns are coming from because each of those portfolios are very pure and you haven't kind of mixed and matched them like internally to the system. Hmm. And then two, you gain this huge diversification benefit because value and momentum in their pure forms, they're like yin and yang, right? They're different religions. So when one is yin and the other one's yang, and, and if you guys remember like portfolio theory, you know, this creates like a great benefit. So we just think it, it's – from a portfolio formation perspective, it makes a lot more sense to kind of run them pure. But, you know, if someone wants to do value and then within their value stocks, you know, look at momentum, I'm not going to say that's a bad idea. We, we just, you know, we're thinking at the portfolio level, we think running it very pure is just at the margin, you know, maybe a more sensible approach. But they're all good. Got it, got it. And Wesley, uh, just thinking intuitively, it seems... When you have a 50-50 kind of a setup, uh, mm -hmm. you'll have a lot lesser drawdown as well. Because when the one's working, other's not, yep. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, it, and we don't actually equal weight them. We do like vol weighting because momentum has a lot more you know, vol than, than value does. So it's not really 50-50, so maybe it's like 60-40 to kind of balance their volatilities. But you can equal weight them and, and yeah, same idea. Exactly. You just want to try to smooth it out a little bit because value, pure value or pure momentum individually, they're just, you know, they're going to be volatile. It's not, you know, it's not like a day trading strategy that works every day. Uh, <laughs> you got to have horizon. So if you combine them, you can hopefully smooth that out a little bit. Right. Uh, Wesley, let me understand this slightly in, uh, in a bit more detail. Um, sure. So... You know, the first time I heard about quality momentum combination, the thing which came to my mind is that you're selecting quality stocks, uh, and I'll come to what I mean by quality, and then investing in them when there is momentum, which obviously was not the case. I mean, I, I think uh, there is a different angle involved there. And yeah, well, you, yeah. you want me to explain? Uh, so, so, so here, here's our. This is basically a summary of you know, 20 years of doing finance research. Right. For value, to exploit the, the so-called value premium, you want to buy cheap stocks. So you got to be in the uber most cheap. And then within cheap, focus on quality, where quality is in reference to, like, fundamental analysis quality, you know, like returns on capital, blah, blah, blah. That's value. Right. Momentum... For momentum, you just focus on relative strength. So you want to buy securities that have strong performance relative to everyone else. Right. But quality there is how it got to its relative strength. You want to look at that price path. 
And then, right. you know, you want it basically, like, you know, as Ed Sakoto said, kind of that 45-degree line, not right. the line that's all over the place. So quality and momentum context means the quality of the price action, not, like, the quality of, you know, the balance sheet. Right. So, and, and that, so cheap, quality for value, where quality is in reference to, like, fundamentals, momentum. You want to buy quality momentum where quality is in reference to that, the nature of that price path and how it gets to its momentum. Right, right. Okay, so um, and when you when you're saying uh, quality, I'm assuming that you're considering the financial strength of it and not only the PNL part, where you're talking about the margins or growth. Uh, you are taking consideration in your book. You have talked about the Petrovsky score and all that stuff. Yeah. So you're combining that's, that's, financial strength. Yeah, yep. so that is what your definition. That's yeah. only for that. Yeah, all that stuff doesn't matter for momentum. Because momentum right. is a different religion, so right. it's just quality metrics like fundamental crap. It just doesn't do anything because it, it's a different world, man. Uh, and that's something that, that a lot of people that are value investors think that that's insane. Um, but that's why I think it works is because you got the two religions, and, you know, and, and like they just the other guys think the other guy's insane. But I'm just a, of the belief that. I think they both work, and the main mission here is to make money, not argue about who's got the best idea. Um, so that's what uh, we're going to try to do. Right. Wesley, um, tell me one thing. So when you went from your uh, Graham type of approach of finding the stocks, cheap cigar yep. butts, uh, yep. or maybe even quality companies at reasonable price, and then you went on to make a quantitative model, first of all, how do you incorporate the the, the concentration was this diversification argument, you know, in that model. So yeah. Warren Buffett says, and, and in, by your own admission, uh, if you can be a concentrated value investor, you are more, uh, you have more chance of making more returns. I'm not, I mean, there's a huge debate yeah. on that, so I don't want to get into that. But mm -hmm. um, when you go into quantitative investing, uh, yeah. can you afford to be that concentrated or do you get to diversify portfolios? How do you approach that angle? Yeah. In your sure. Opinion. So, um, I mean, actually, Warren Buffett is one hundred percent correct. So, so, and it, and it makes sense, right? Like, let's just assume, without argument, that value works, right? Well, and so, you know that if if you have five hundred securities and you rank them on some sort of value metric, right. obviously, if you hold the top four hundred, you basically <laughs> own the market. So, it's not going to do anything, right? If you own the top <laughs> twenty. You know, obviously, it's going to work a lot better because you didn't diversify the thing. And then yeah. so, so that's not even an argument. Like, that's just, he's right. Yeah, now, he's now the question is, is uh, magic formula yeah. Also. yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And th so then the question is, how much pain can you handle in the short run and how much career risk can you handle, right? Because, you know, and, and we run all our portfolios usually between 30 and 50 securities because cause that's concentrated enough where you're getting a lot of volatility and a ton of career risk. But, you know, if you get down to, like, 10 stock or 20 stock portfolios, um, you know, you're almost taking a little bit too much individual company risk. And we're, we're regulated by a lot of, like, government entities where you're just not allowed to do that. Right. So, you know, you know, maybe you'd want to do it maybe a 20 stock portfolio or 25, but you just can't do that. So, we, you know, we usually do 30 to 50. That's about as concentrated as you'd want to get. I mean, that's all you need, though. That that's already plenty of career risk, and you're going to get fired, you know, every few years probably. But that's that's perfect. That's why it works is because it's painful. Right. Um, right. And, and so I think that's where you want to be is is usually in that kind of thirty to fifty range, especially if you're doing it quantitatively. Um, right. You know, if you're a fundamental qualitative person, and you know, I'm. I'm just. I don't think that works. But let's just pretend that you had skills because you you got like Warren Buffett capabilities. <laughs> then you you know clearly you'd want to concentrate that a little bit more and maybe get down to the you know ten to twenty range. But you got to be really, really confident <laughs> in your capabilities, obviously. <laughs> um, right. But let me let me again understand. So when are you when you're taking let's say thirty securities, right? Yep. And depending on, and I, I'm assuming that you have fixed a percentage for momentum and value in your combination, right? Well, so so we run them pure, yeah. So so I'll, I'll walk you through it. So here's exactly how we do it because we do this right. in real life. 
So, right. and I'll just make it easy. So we got a thousand stocks, right? Right. And we're going to run value. So, right. and I'll just keep it really simple. So what we, we want to do, do generically is we want to get to the cheap. So we go to the DESA. So we got a thousand stocks. We're going to go to the top ten percent cheapest. So now how do you we define cheap? Then? How are we defining cheap? On, we, uh, we define cheap uh, using enterprise multiples, um, and and that's just because Jack and I, one of my colleagues, we, you know, we we just data mined it. We we wrote this paper that got published in uh, Journal of Portfolio Management. We kind of summarized it in quantitative value. Sure. We, we said, you know what? Let's just data mine it. We could do you know, eight-year earnings to, to market. We could do free cash flow. There's all, there's literally like millions of combinations of way you can assess, quote-unquote, value. We right. just did a data mining exercise and just right. said, hey, computer, tell us what works the best. And then, then after that, we'll, we'll try to figure out what is the most robust and, and you know, basically the best data mine version. And it, and it turns out that enterprise multiples seem to be the most effective and – they're incredibly simple and, and straightforward, and they kind of make sense because business buyers, i.e., private equity guys, that's how they're going to buy a firm. So that's what we use. But so so you got a thousand stocks, you go to a hundred. Then amongst the hundred, we would then rank everyone on their quality. So looking at like we we're talking about, you know, long term returns on capital, blah blah blah. Then let's just say we split it in half. So now we have fifty stocks. Right. Okay. Done. For momentum. What we do is you got a thousand stocks. We figure out, all, we calculate last let's say twelve month returns, rank every single security on that. We right. go to the top ten percent. So we got the hundred stocks with the best relative strength. Then amongst those, we sort those on which ones have the smoother, you know, higher quality momentum. And let's say we get the top half. So we got fifty there. So, so, th- so that's how we do it. We do pure value, pure momentum, and it's just like fil- – it's a filter mechanism um, to get down to, you know, your, your portfolio. And you can just make it – if you want to get to 30, you know, instead of doing – if you got got 100 stocks, instead of doing 50-50, you right. just say, hey, we're, gonna, we're only going to take the top 30%, you know, right. whatever you want to do. Um, so. You know, but, but my question is, uh, uh, you know, um, it's 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 fairly simple. With what will you do when there are more mm-hmm. companies, and you can you know be a bit more stringent mm-hmm. um, in your process. But yep. you know, at times, let's say, so you must have back tested, and let's say you keep a sixty forty between momentum mm-hmm. and value, and yeah. there will be times when in your valuation parameters. Mm-hmm. Uh, you wouldn't be getting that many companies, uh, the peaks of the markets, 2006, seven yeah. kind of markets. And at that time, your value, which is 40%, let's say, or 60%, yeah. I don't know which part you prefer, yeah. but let's say if it's 40% and you have just two stocks, mm-hmm. do you go 20% each? And yeah, so, in your so back all system, our stuff all is, um, yeah, we're, we don't do valuation based market timing because it doesn't work uh in, in from a tactical perspective so just because we know that we're at the 99 percent you know cape ratio historically it turns out that there is no evidence that i know of that you can use that from a tactical timing perspective i.e you can't build a system that says hey you know if we're at the 90 percentile and higher on valuations Let's go to cash and then only get reinvested when it gets cheap. That's, that just doesn't work. Trend works. Momentum works for market timing, not valuations. So when we build our portfolios based on value, it's always relative. So we will always have 50 stocks, right? Because if there's 1,000 stocks, we go to the top 100 and then to the top 50 based on quality. We're going to always own 50. They may That whole basket may be relatively more expensive than it was – in another market, but we don't we don't have like a like a set absolute cutoff. It's always relative, um, and we do that for a very explicit reason, because we think that stock selection algorithms that is a total different field than market timing. Got right. It. So what we always want to do is we just want to go buy the cheapest, highest quality, and we want to buy the best momentum. And then managing the beta or the market timing shit 
is a whole different science. That's where you get into trend following, technicals. You, you, the minute you bring valuation into market timing, it's just a failure. Uh, it doesn't work. Um, and I think that's why value investors are, you know, they, they need to branch out a little bit because they always like sit in cash and then miss, you know, 200% market moves. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, we just don't do that. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so essentially, in the in the absolute peak of the markets, your momentum portfolio is going to take care of uh, uh, the return component, um, and when the things are getting cheaper, your value portfolio is essentially going to pick the best companies because it's relative, um, yeah. because going to pick the best companies in the top mm -hmm. uh, decile or whatever, uh, whatever top yeah, fifty exactly. companies take so, something like that. Yeah, you got it. So, so if you go through like the market crash, um, like like let's say the internet bubble, right? So, right. so in 1999, obviously momentum is going to probably own maybe not a lot of internet stocks because it's not it's not high quality momentum. But you're going to own some. You're going to own all these high flyers. And you're going to be like ripping it, you know. And then on the value side, because even at that time, even though the overall market valuation was insane because of all the internet stocks, there were actually a lot of relatively cheap companies that's why warren buffett underperformed that whole period so value is just going to own the cheap stuff no one likes momentum is going to own these high flyers um and, and obviously that you know helps that portfolio and then when that switches in 2000 you know momentum starts blowing up you start rotating out actually into more you know value like securities because they're having relative strength that's better and then right. on the value side that starts kicking butt um right. and, and that's just they're like yin and yang right uh, uh wesley for the benefit of the readers can we uh slightly you know delve into a bit of details um on the momentum end when you say are you combining momentum part you are saying relative strength that is fine are you also yeah. using any other technical uh, indicators like moving averages or anything else you want to throw light on and as to how you time your exits and mm -hmm. entries into the technical portfolio if i can sure yeah yeah so um so again so we we break up uh stock selection and, and from market timing so for the stock selection component our mission is what, what is, is the most evidence-based approach, approach that's, that's also, also not data mine or optimized to select securities based on some sort of technical analysis. And the evidence, okay. at least as we view it, is relative strength momentum with a focus on quality momentum. So then the second component is, well, how do you time the market beta on that? And that's where we just do long-term trend following. So you have all your stocks that are, let's say, high relative strength stocks that have you know quality momentum. And then we're just going to always own those. But then the question is, well, you know, when do you want to own the beta on that? Um, and that, that's where you use like trend following. So you know, we always want to own the relative strength quality names. But if the market's blowing up, you know, obviously we don't want to own any market risk. So you wouldn't own those names. You want to own anything. You just be in cash. Um, but but that's like a separate piece. It's you know, it's about the market timing piece is separated from the stock selection piece. We don't have that integrated in, um, mainly because we don't think it works, right? So, so if you use like trend following on individual stock names, because it's so noisy, because individual stocks, you know, bounce all over the place. Right. There, there's too many. You know, there's too much. Uh, there's too much noise and not enough signal. Um, so you end up, you know, just trading a lot and burn a lot of money on frictional costs. Got so. It. We just don't do that, but I'm sure people could figure that out. We just haven't been able to. Okay, and and what's the frequency of uh, you know uh, rebalancing a portfolio yeah. or maybe going back to the algorithms? How frequently do you do that? Uh, yeah, is so, it a yearly uh, exercise? Like uh, no, no. That? So yeah, with value, it's a way slower mo moving thing. So you can do like we do quarterly, but you could do annual. It'd be you'd be all right. Um, okay. With momentum strategies like relative strength. You have to trade frequently. Like it won't, it doesn't work at like annual rebounds uh, frequency. So you have to be at least quarterly, in our opinion. And then if, if you have, like we have a little bit more scale, you know, and, and frictional costs and taxes, a lot of other things 
actually really matter. So, you know, if I had like a million dollars and, you know, and I didn't really care, you know, I, you could go down like monthly, you know, you can go crazy on, on the turnover and, and you at the margin, if you have really lean frictional costs, you know, that's going to be probably your best expectation. But, you know, sometimes you actually got to take in the reality of trading costs. So, so we think kind of somewhere between like a monthly and quarterly rebounds on, on relative strength strategies, it seems to be, you know, a reasonable trade-off between performance and, and frictional. But you, you just can't be beyond that because then you're, you know, it doesn't, it's not going to work anymore. It has to be a high-frequency uh, strategy. Right. And, and you know, Wesley, I, I actually went through your blog and I noticed that the, the, the momentum uh, portfolio generated, the back test showed that generated 16% uh, CAGR, uh, mm -hmm. or was it 18? Uh, I think two percentage points better than the uh, the value one. Yeah. But uh, I'm sure if you include the the commissions and the transaction costs, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they would be more or less same, wouldn't they? Well, yeah. So I think the numbers you're quoting there are actually after a lot of transaction costs, because because oh. in general, like momentum strategies, just generic, mm -hmm. usually are anywhere from like eighteen to twenty, depending on how mm -hmm. you do them before cost. Value strategies, just before cost, generically, you know, maybe depending on how you do it, it's between 16 and 18. Over, this is over like, you know, 50, 60 years. Now, right. after cost on momentum, because it's way more expensive, let's say you're 20, just to, for benefit of doubt. Let's say that costs you four points, right? So now you're down to 16, where value, maybe you're, you know, let's say you're 16 to 17, but maybe the cost on that is like one to two, so maybe we're down at 15 or 16. So net of cost, you know, momentum we think probably has a has a has a small edge, like maybe a percentage point. Um, but yeah, it's it's just it's not a huge edge after cost. But I think it does have a little bit of edge though. And I don't know what's the story in the United States. In India, mm -hmm. that edge would probably go away with taxes. In in, yeah. in value investing, you don't pay taxes if you hold it for more than a year. The, yeah, yeah, that that, that we, we still would pay taxes, taxes here, um, for sure. sure. But and that that's why we've gotten into the ETF business because there, there's through the ETF structure you can basically rebalance efficiently and and build deferral. So you kind of solve the tax problem. Um, it, yeah, so, so with value and momentum, so so th that doesn't that no longer plays a role because we've solved that problem. Got but it. if you operate these things in a hedge fund or a managed account or whatever, yeah, value investing on an after tax basis is probably going to be a lot better than momentum investing is just because of the turnover problems. Got it. Now, uh, Wesley, you know, with the advent of robo advisors, uh, the yep. the competition is heating uh, heating up and. So everyone is more or less offering the same thing, you know. Uh, yeah. How do you create a differentiator? I mean, what I'm asking is that yeah. it has almost become a commoditized business, you know. How how do you build a brand in that? Yeah, so what we did is, uh, like, all the robos are basically saying, hey, we're going to go buy a bunch of Vanguard funds and hold them for you. Well, that's stupid, like. Anyone can do that. Like, why would I pay someone to do that? So what we did is we said, hey, let's go build an active robo that implements, like, you know, what are considered pretty sophisticated techniques for normal people, like trend following overlays, you know, all these sort of things that typically in the past, you know, you'd have to go to Ed Sakota to go buy his 2 and 20 fund or whatever, right? So what we, what we said is let's try to deliver an active robo strategy at affordable costs where we hold like a global diversified portfolio, but we apply trend following and, and timing rules on it. So we kind of capture global premiums, but we do so with downside protection. Right. And no one's doing that because so many people are brainwashed to think that, you know, buy and hold forever is, is going to somehow protect you from, you know, market drawdowns. And, and we're just trying to give people an alternative. Right. And I don't know why other robos don't do that. Um, but we just said, hey, well, you know, someone should probably do that. So that, that, that's what that's how we're differentiating, trying to deliver active, not just buy and hold Vanguard funds, which is a reasonable approach, but it's not differentiated. Got it. Got it. Uh, right. Wesley, uh, I have one question on the size of the companies you dwell in. Uh, so 
you know, there is a great amount of research and it is, um, I mean, it's beyond doubt that small cap and micro cap companies tend to create far more value um, mm-hmm. for the holders of the companies for a long period of time. And yep. um, the larger cap companies are, of, of course, I mean, because of the size, they can't go much too fastly and they're more compounders than wealth creators. Um, mm-hmm. In your quantitative model, how do you, you know, balance the conundrum of the size? Do you have a size cutoff or do yep. you go from micro cap to large cap, anything that fits the bill? And have you have you done a back test separating the, you know, the various cap, market cap based uh, segregations? Yeah, so we've, um, I mean, I've been doing this for many, many years and I have all the data essentially memorized at this point. Um, so, yeah, we've done every test on the planet Earth that you could ever imagine and done all this in real life, too. Um, right. Basically, value has a very large size component to it, right, in general. So it still works at the margin in the most big mega caps, but it's very small edge. As you start getting down into large cap, mid cap, um, you know, it's a lot better. And then when you get into small cap, you know, it's even better. But, you know, when you start going to the real market and you have to go trade these things, and I, you know, I used to trade penny stocks in special situations, you know, the even let's say you have a 2 3% edge in the micro cap or the small cap. Well, if you go and look at the limit books on a lot of these stocks, you're going to eat 10% just in the bid-ask spread. So I'm of the opinion that... Net of transaction costs and reality, you know, the sweet spot for value is probably that mid-cap range, like like liquid tradable mid-caps, um, whereas and maybe you could get into the small caps, but I just think after transaction costs, and if you're trying to do this with real money, it just, it doesn't make any sense. Like, if, you know, if you had a small account and you're bored, um, you know, would you maybe tilt towards micros and small in value? Sure. Uh, but, the but the minute you compound, compound your money, money you, you would basically compound, compound yourself out of, out of that edge really, really quickly, quickly, and it was a waste of time. So right. I'm, I'm not, not a big, big fan of it personally, but there's, there's definitely, definitely an edge there. there. It's just I, I, I question how big the edge is after real incorporation of the real transaction costs. Got it. So, Wesley, I, I just wanted to ask you, do you have your own skin in the game? Do you invest in your own ETF? Uh, yeah, of course. So, so we, we basically make all of our products for our own money. So me and all my partners have, you know, hundred percent of our capital invested in our own stuff, wow. uh, you know, for better or worse. Um, yeah, of course we, we, uh, yeah, we, we don't, we're not like other guys where we're like, Hey, invest in our fund. And then, you know, <laughs> they don't even invest in it. Like we, we put all our money in this stuff because <laughs> to us, we, you know, we build these things. Um, you know, so we can invest in them too. So we obviously put all our own money in this stuff. That's great. Right. So, um, so Wesley, let me just, uh, you know, differentiate. I think uh, I'll give a brief, brief, uh, brief intro about your books also. Um, uh, when I finished Quantitative Value, uh, the first thing that came to my mind was there will be a lot and lot of misses, you know, uh, and obviously with a hindsight bias there. Mm-hmm. Um for example, I'll give you a simple example. I was thinking um, in your strategies, you mentioned the pro- high profit margin companies, right? In your quantitative model. Now, the yeah. moment you mention high quant- high profit margin, you actually miss out on those kind of the Costco kind of companies and the Walmarts of the world, mm-hmm. uh, which will never figure out in that model for a simple reason that they they uh, are more of asset terms and not margins. So yeah, and. So yep, I'm, I'm so, assuming that you're willing to take that misses. That's fine. Uh, well, um, yeah, yeah. Look, but let me explain how that algorithm is actually – the profit margin algorithm actually has two components to it. It, it, it. it obviously benefits high, but it also benefits stable. So in that system, if you're really, really stable, but maybe not that high, you, you could still be ranked pretty, pretty well. Like obviously the ideal firm – is someone that has insanely high stable increasing. margins that are really high, but right. in reality, you know, that doesn't happen. So you can actually get like a Walmart or a Costco in there based on that profit margin algorithm because it's meant to try to capture and, and give the benefit. Wrong, of the, don't yeah. you have a cutoff of profit margin if I'm not wrong? 
There is no, a stop no, button. It, it's it's not a cutoff. It, it's set up as a sharp ratio, basically. So it's it takes the last eight year uh, profit margin over the standard deviation of the profit margin. So yeah, that's it's meant to be a, yeah. And so, so you can and then you take the growth part uh, using the, you take the growth part using the uh, the, the geometric uh, multiples, right? Well, so so on the margins, the the there it's actually took a lot of thinking because if you think about it. There's two ways you can be really good on gross margin. You can either be growing your margins, but then by definition, if you're growing your margins, you can't have stable margins. But stable margins could also be an indication of moat. So what we do is for every single firm in the entire universe, we calculate your margin growth and give it a ranking. And then we calculate your margin stability um, Ranking and then we you get you get the the best score on both of those. So you can either be stable, low vol margin, or you could be positive growing margin. And we we would rank we would like but we would like both of them. Right. Um, and, and so that that's how we do it to try to to, to try to eliminate the problem you mentioned, where we may just systematically be booting out you know Costco because they don't grow margins, but they just keep it the same and it never moves. Right. Right. But that's also an indication of like quality. So we want right. to not penalize that guy. So then you take the maximum of the two rankings. Yeah. Right. Because obviously, like Costco is going to have terrible growth ranking because <laughs> right. you know, it doesn't grow yeah. margins. But it's going to have an amazing stability ranking. You know, so we we want to give him the best the best ranking he could get. Amongst those two things, right. uh, so, you know, to, you to know, forget Costco. Benefit. I think even the larger consumer names, uh, there are a lot of companies will be stable on margins and not growing. If I'm not wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like Procter and Gamble, like all, all the classic moat firms, right? Um, are, are going to have kind of real stable, uh, very margins. high margins. Yeah, exactly. So, and those are great. That we want to we want to give them the the benefit of that. Great, great. Um, so uh, that's it from our end, uh, Wesley. It was great talking to you. But before we wrap up, um, would you suggest few people you have enormous respect for who you think we should, uh, you know, uh, interview and podcast and profile um, people you want to refer to? Um, I'm trying to think. Um, but Tobias is in the list for sure. So besides Tobias. Yeah, yeah, Tobias you got to <laughs> chat with. Um, yeah, I can get you in touch with a guy named Gary Antonacci. Uh, he wrote a book called Dual Momentum. Right. He's a uh, he's he's obviously on the other religion. Um, <laughs> he doesn't think <laughs> he doesn't think value investing is a great idea, and that's fine. You know, I mean, everyone's got their own thing, but like he he may be a good guy to talk to. Right. Um, and he, he's an older guy. He you know he's been around. He used to work for Paul Tudor Jones. Oh, wow. He knows Ed Sakota. Like he knows all the. Actually, know. I think he knows Ed Sakota because I think Ed Sakota wrote a blurb for his book. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. So he's he's like seventy or something. So he's been around the block and you know been there, done that. So he, he's and he's a really cool guy. He's a friend of mine. Um, right. So yeah, maybe reach out to him. He's a cool sure. guy. Sure. So, sure. But. Uh, and, and, and you know, anything else strikes you, you can obviously uh, tell us. And uh, uh, I think that's yeah. it from my end. That's it from our end. Thanks a lot, Wesley. Wesley, yeah, you... go for it, guys. I think uh, <laughs> I think your setup is great. Like combine a technical guy with a, a value guy and pool that portfolio, and right. yeah, go take over the world over there. I think it's a great <laughs> idea. Thanks, Wesley. Thank One you. last question from my side: uh, When is your book coming out? Um, the Quant Momentum book will be out. It depends on the publisher, but I, I just knowing how slow they are, it'll probably be like November, December of next year. But if you guys just subscribe to our blog feed, um, it, you know, or, or readers do, or, or your listeners, you know, eventually there'll be an announcement about it, or, or Wiley will reach out. Sure, Wesley. Looking Wait. forward to that. Definitely looking forward. Looking forward to Thanks, that. Wesley. All right, guys. Sounds good. Sorry about missing you next week. Uh, uh, but appreciate you, the chat and uh, best of luck out there, guys. I think you'll do well. Side Wesley, it was great talking to you. Take care now. All right, see you, Joe. Thank you, Wesley. All, All right. right, see you guys. Yeah. Bye. Bye.